So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it was kind to the extent that I could understand it. I actually had some French in school, but that's 30 or 40 years ago, and I just forgot all the words. Uh, so thanks for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here at this uh, prestigious place. And this is the only uh, piece uh, I can offer in French. So the English title is Knowledge Harvesting from the Web. This is not just my work, but I've had uh, the great luck and uh, pleasure to work with bright students, uh, excellent postdocs, and colleagues and collaborators. So two of them are actually here in the, in the room, Fabian Suchanek and Nicoleta uh, Preda. Since they are here, I want to mention them. Right? So without all these great people, none of what I'm going to present would have happened. So knowledge from the web, what do I mean by this? Well, in principle, the, 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 the web has the potential of being the world's uh, most comprehensive knowledge base almost from the day of its inception. Uh, but that knowledge is kind of latent. It's hidden under a humongous pile of, uh, of noisy contents, of, of, of junk contents often, right? So what we want to do here um, is to distill uh, out the valuable contents from, from the web and organize it in a systematic manner so that we can call it a knowledge base, a formal representation of knowledge so that computers can, can interpret it and can use it to, to uh, boost uh, intelligent behavior or simulate intelligent behavior in applications. So that's uh, the mission. Now, um, I understand last week there was a lecture by Georg Gottlob on information extraction. So uh, what uh, I said so far and what you see in the next few minutes will, might resemble some of what Georg talked about. Uh, there are commonalities. So yes, information extraction plays a role here. But there are also big differences. And the differences are in the overriding goals. So in information extraction, we typically start uh, with a set of homogeneous web pages whose contents is generated by a deep web database or from a deep web database. And now the task is to extract values of a specific set of attributes so that we can populate a table like the one you see on the right hand side. So we, uh, and a typical application scenario is find out about products and prices and ratings and these kinds of things. So in our setting, we look at the entirety of, of the web, and we have a much more heterogeneous set of inputs, potential inputs at least, and, in, and, and we don't, we're not driven by a specific set of output like prices or ratings, but instead we'd like to gather as much as possible that we, we can organize into a knowledge base. Um, in particular, we're interested in the entities that we spot in these web uh, pages like people, uh, places, landmarks, organizations, pro products too, right? And then also uh, relationships between these entities, like who has invented what, who works for which organization, uh, which place is named after which person, and so forth. So, um, however, we do have a, a, a luxury here. We do have one joker, if you wish. So we, can, uh, we don't need to understand each and every of these wild pages, but we have the luxury. Can you spin the lights? Oh, I'm too dark here? Or, oh, I'm, or I'm blocking something? Oh, because of the camera. Okay. So I'll stand here. I'll, I like walking around usually, but OK, that's fine. So we don't have to understand every exotic and noisy page, but we have the luxury of cherry picking. And, um, so we can use the, or pick the, the pages first that give us the best mileage for the effort. So, and not surprisingly, you, this resembles a Wikipedia page, so you will see in a short while that Wikipedia is, is, a, is a great asset here that gives us a, a, a head start on that mission. So here's the plan for the coming 55 or 50 minutes. Um, I'll first like to explain what I mean by knowledge for machines. So what exactly should a knowledge base look like? And then we'll turn to the constructive part, uh, and this goes in two uh, stages. So first, I'll tell you how to do this cherry picking. So how can we get a head start on building a large knowledge base? And then we go to the harder part in item three here. So the, uh, uh, how can we tab into arbitrary text and web pages in order to uh, extract more knowledge and better knowledge and improve the knowledge base? In the fourth part, I would like to turn the story around. So by 180 degrees. So in that part, I will assume we have a strong knowledge base, and I want to explain 
how can we utilize it? How can we harness it for, for uh, letting computers behave intelligently? And if time permits, I have a couple of slides on further research opportunities and open issues. So what's knowledge for machines? Well, uh, this is a kaleidoscope of different kinds of knowledge, and whatever is on the slide is in scope, and what's not on the slide is out of scope. I'm not claiming that computers should have the same kind of really uh, sophisticated and comprehensive knowledge that humans have, right? But there are things that computers can do very well and at large scale, and that makes them simulate intelligence in certain situations. So factual knowledge is the first item here. Um, who is born where, who has uh, worked for which organization, who has won which kinds of prizes. And these take the form of binary predicates or instances of binary relations. And the arguments of these relations are typed. So the relations have a type signature. For example, uh, born in here, that binary relation or predicate uh, expects a person as a first argument and a location as a second. Now, speaking of types or uh, I could also say semantic classes, uh, they have instances, so entities belong to semantic classes, like Steve Jobs is an uh, instance of the class of computer architects, and this is um, kind of taxonomic knowledge, so we'd like to capture this in a knowledge base, and in addition, all these classes have specialization, subclasses, and generalization superclasses, or that too belongs in a taxonomic database. And that's actually the primary ingredient for saying uh, tax, taxonomy, uh, taxonomic knowledge. Um, the, the units in the semantic knowledge space, like entities, classes, abstract concepts, uh, are still connected and should be connected to the, the way we refer to them in surface wording. So when we mean New York City, we usually say sloppily New York, or we say NYC, or Big Apple, and so on. And that connection between words or phrases on one hand and the concepts on the other hand is important to capture as well. So we call this here lexical or terminological knowledge. And this uh, in, in involves both synonymy, like in the New York City case, as well as the opposite called homonymy. Uh, so MS, for example, can have very different meanings depending on context. We can try to uh, broaden this into the hundreds of languages that are uh, important on this planet. Um, and finally, we need to position knowledge uh, in the time dimension. Nothing lasts forever, so things change. And so we need to capture for event, facts about events, when did this happen as a time point, and for relationships from when until when did this last. Uh, some of this ended recently. Uh, so there's a time span or time interval associated with uh, the facts here. Obviously, we don't, don't want just to hand compile, manually craft a knowledge base like on the previous uh, slide. That's slideware, right? We want software and we want automated solutions and we want to work, uh, have them work at large scale. So ideally a knowledge base should contain millions of entities um, and hundreds of thousands of classes and maybe even billions of facts about these entities, facts being instances of relations. In addition, you could have uh, some uh, level of common sense properties. Humans are uh, male or female. Uh, this is uh, mutually exclusive and there is no third option. Every human must have exactly one mother, exactly one father, and so on. So this kind of common sense knowledge that every child kind of implicitly knows, but computers are very dumb up front. Uh, so you need to uh, have this uh, as additional intentional knowledge as well, and that could be combined with the factual knowledge, but in, so that we enable smart reasoning. But in this talk, I will not uh, get into this topic. So there's plenty of projects along these lines, uh, which all uh, took off in the last four or five years, and these three are particularly uh, worthwhile mentioning. So DBpedia is a large knowledge base, Iago is a large knowledge base, and Freebase. These are probably the largest and most comprehensive uh, universal uh, knowledge bases available today. They're all publicly available. DBpedia is a project at uh, two German universities. Iago is a project that uh, uh, happened at our institute. Uh, Freebase is commercial and now owned by Google. So these are general purpose, universal knowledge bases. There's lots of specialized ones. So uh, Uniprot is uh, obviously specialized to protein data and genomic data. 
uh, music princes, entertainment data. Beachopedia is a very cute collection of about 10 beaches with wonderful surf opportunities. So you have a chance to explore this uh, really rich knowledge base, go for it. Uh, and these are not just standalone collections, but they are interlinked, they're interconnected, and they're interconnected at the entity level. So when Iago knows uh, a singer, then maybe Music Brains knows the same singer, perhaps with a slightly different name. So there's no naming conventions across the entire web. But we could as assert or specify a same as assertion. This entry here is really refers to the same entity as this entry over there. And this way, uh, we actually can utilize complementary information. Some properties that Iago knows uh, are not known to Music Brains and vice versa. And by that, in this uh, web of linked data, as it's often called, or the linked data cloud, um, the, all the ingredients together could actually be a lot more than just the sum of the parts. So knowledge bases are not an end by themselves. It's not that we want to construct a knowledge base and then say, we're done, and then walk away, right? So what are they good for? They are an enabling technology, like business to business, if you wish. They are a piece of infrastructure. And the kinds of applications that knowledge bases can enable are of this kind. They are all things that AI has been dreaming about for many years. Uh, disambiguating natural language, both uh, written and spoken. Uh, reasoning with logical inferences and background knowledge, for example, in games, in a game situation where the computer participates in a game. Machine reading is about summarizing a large book or entire corpora. For example, uh, today's postings, the entirety of today's postings on all the news in the world and all the social media of the world. And give me a briefing of, about this in, in, in two minutes or 20 lines and so on, right? Automatically generated. Semantic search is about lifting Google to the next generation. And entity level linkage, I just uh, uh, refer to the web of linked data. Couldn't we generate these entity level same as links automatically? I want to give a few concrete examples for the fourth item, semantic search. Um, so this is an example of politicians who are also scientists. Um, you type this into Google, and Google gives you back 10 million pages which contain these two keywords, politicians and scientists. That's no help. Uh, what you want, actually, is you want a list of people, just the people names or maybe even their references into a knowledge base, such that these people are mayors, state secretaries, prime ministers, etc., but at the same time scientists, for example, because they have a doctoral degree. So Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, would qualify here. European composers who have won film music awards, Ennio Morricone would be an answer, Bruno Coulet, Coulet. Uh, might be an answer, and there's plenty of good answers, and we, we want them really in a concise and precise manner. French professors who founded internet companies, so Sasha Bitbull would be one answer, and there should be more, of course. Um, in all these cases, we start the, the question with a set of uh, semantic classes, politicians, French compo or European composers, and some relationships like uh, have won or founded, uh, and then we expect as the output a set of entities or maybe entity pairs or groups of entities, things of this kind. Sometimes it's the other way around. We are given entities and we are nothing else when we are wondering for the relationship. What is an interesting relationship between a set of people? What do these four people have in common? Alexander Pushkin, the Russian poet. Evarist Galois, father of modern algebra. Johnny Ringo, a Western gunfighter. And Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Does anybody know? Or you can look up some knowledge base on the web if you wish. They died early. They died early, not too bad, but not close, but not quite. Any other guesses? Okay, I give it away. They all died in a duel or shortly after the duel because of whatever happened in the duel. So I wanted to start this talk on a lighter note to see you smile a bit. Um, now I have a fifth example here. I don't want to elaborate on this. But all this is look like toy questions and quiz uh, style uh, Mickey Mouse things. There are serious applications, serious information needs where people care about getting precise and concise answers in life sciences, in health uh, discussion forums, for example. And they are actually structurally and, by, and in, in their need for semantically crisp answers similar to what I explained here. 
So now let's turn to uh, constructing a knowledge base and we'll start with a bit of history. So this, these two people created the fir world's first knowledge base. And I'll explain why in a minute, but you all know them, right? I mean, here in Paris, you have to know. Yeah, yeah okay, I hear this. Yeah, I, I, you are just too shy to tell me, right? So, <laughs> so Diderot and D'Alembert, of course, they created the Encyclopédie. And this was the world's first Wikipedia because there were more than 2,000 contributors. So it was a rich knowledge sharing community already more than 250 years ago. Now, why do I call it a knowledge base? Because it had this sophisticated taxonomic backbone, the uh, Système Figuré des Connoissances Humaines, uh, a tree of classes or, or categories, if you wish, and all the 70,000 articles were placed in this. And it's very fine-grained. And here's an example. Here's the article about logique. Uh, I need to read it, so this is why. So it has this wonderful sentence, la logique est la de penser juste. So you cannot imagine any better and crisper definition, and maybe it's a bit simplified compared to what we think about logics today. And uh, you see again here uh, where, uh, some of the uh, taxonomic system. Today, of course, we can visualize this in a hyperbolic projection. So here's logique, and it belongs to science de l'homme, which belongs to raison, which belongs to entendement. Entendement is the root of the whole taxonomy. And it goes down here, right? It's very fine-grained. So in that spirit, the encyclopedie was also the world's first WordNet. Now, what is WordNet? Today, we have a, uh, we have a, a, a collection, a thesaurus um, called WordNet, uh, which is a rich, probably the world's richest taxonomic knowledge structure uh, created by these two people at Princeton. And what it does, it maps words like enterprise uh, to their word senses, to their meanings. And of course, many words are ambiguous, so it can map to multiple senses. You see three senses here, like enterprise in the sense of general endeavor uh, or in the sense of a business uh, organization. And there's a third one here. Um, this is done very systematically and at large scale, but it's all handcrafted. Um, and it has a, a taxonomic uh, subclass, superclass structure. So here we have subclasses of the second sense of enterprise, giant, collective, and then business organization. And you, we can drill down further, second level, so we, it's very fine grained we can go further. Um, now, what's striking, however, is that, yes, this knows everything about what kinds of businesses and enterprises we have on this planet, but it doesn't know any individual enterprise. It has never heard about Google or, or, uh, um, or what, some, give me some French company, right? A famous French company. The Internet uh, Memory Organization, for example, right? Uh, and, and things of this kind. So it doesn't know anything, right? And obviously, to behave intelligently for the computer, you have to, to be founded in the real world. You cannot just have this abstract knowledge. Uh, in the end, uh, like semantic search, in the end you want, you want people or companies as answers. You don't want just another class, so, and then you, you still have to look it up, right? So we can try further. So this is another entry in WordNet, entrepreneur, the people who have founded the uh, enterprises. And here we have instances. It's not that WordNet doesn't have that at all, but now you see it has, for the class of entrepreneurs, a, a impressive number of two entries, two instances. So Bill Gates, whom all of we, is, who's known to all of us, and Cirque Life, uh, Miles Sinclair, who probably nobody remembers, right? Um, so that's the, the strengths and the weakness of WordNet. The strengths is it has this fine-grained system of what classes. It has uh, more than 100,000 classes, right? So it's really uh, big, and it was all handcrafted, hand-compiled. Uh, but it has few or, in many cases, no instances, right? So that's a big deficiency. So this is where an opportunity arose about four or five years ago, because then... What started with the encyclopedie now became today's Wikipedia, right? And today's Wikipedia at some point became big and well-structured and high quality. Early on in 2000 or 2001, yes, it was shaky, uh, but in 2006, 2007, it became a very exciting asset. And so you, we could start processing it with uh, knowledge harvesting technology. 
And in particular, it would know lots of individual entities like Steve Jobs as an entrepreneur. And it would know Google and the Internet Memory Organization and, and IBM and you name it. Um, and so but we, what we could do now or what you could envision is you, we look carefully, the, we meaning the computer or software, at this text and figure out that, yes, Steve Jobs is an entrepreneur. And then we put... Steve Jobs as an instance into that semantic class. So we populate the semantic classes that WordNet gives us. Now, from the text, it's not so easy, but there's other elements. Now we're getting to the uh, harvesting part, picking low-hanging fruit, giving us a head start in, in building up large knowledge bases. So we have these semi-structured elements in Wikipedia, these so-called info boxes, which give us uh, pairs of uh, attribute uh, names, like occupation and attribute values. And maybe we can read off the membership of Steve Jobs in a particular class. But there's an even, for that purpose, for finding instances of classes, there's an even better ingredient. That's the category system. Uh, so the Wikipedia community places articles in one, two, or 10, or 100 different categories. And these names are indicative. So this says American computer business people. Now we strip off the first two words and we remain at business people. So business people is a synonym in WordNet to entrepreneur, right? So uh, voila, so we have now an instance of the class entrepreneur. Similarly with American Zen Buddhists, so we can populate the class of Buddhists because a Zen Buddhist is also a Buddhist and so forth. Unfortunately, not everything is easy. So here, American technology company founders, so we populate the class founders. Always keep the last word. But what is a founder? That's not a semantic concept. Founder of what, right? I cannot be, did I find my key that I lost, or did I found a company? What is founder, right? Um, so here, this makes sense only if we parse it differently. We have to pick up company founders, right? That's a difference. And that's not always so easy. The, in general, these are noun phrases, and understanding noun phrases in their structure is not, is, is not exactly easy. Now, these are mostly easy cases, but it can be difficult. Internet pioneers. So yes, this is a pioneer, but pioneer is ambiguous. So a pioneer can be an inventor of some technology, or it can be someone that can be a colonist, right? These are were also called pioneers. And then there's misleading entries because this is a rich category system, but the people who have built this and who contribute to it are not well-trained in, in the sense of let's do a knowledge base. So they, many of these are associative. So Steve Jobs being in, being in that category does not make him an instance of the class of apples or Apple computers, right? That would be misleading. So we need to do these kinds of mappings. So we start with Wikipedia category names, and we want to map to classes in WordNet. And if we can do this at large scale, then we have the best of both. Then we have WordNet with a rich taxonomic system, very clean, extremely carefully done. And we have millions of entities from Wikipedia. And this was actually done, and Fabian Sohanek was the main person actually back then. And then meanwhile, others have contributed. So in Yago, we did exactly this mapping carefully with automated algorithms, not manually, right? And this way we build up a large knowledge base which now combines uh, lots of classes, so 100,000 or 150,000 from WordNet, and then lots of Wikipedia categories, namely those that can be carefully mapped over here, not everything, right? And, and then lots of entities. So this is not the only project of this kind. DBpedia is even bigger in terms of facts but is uh, weaker in terms of semantic classes. Freebase has more entities because it uh, captures also uh, business relevant entities like music songs or uh, uh, electronics products and so on. And Nell is kind of interesting. It's uh, orders of magnitude smaller, but it's kind of interesting because it has uh, a different methodology where it tries to learn everything from scratch. So no. Um, manually cur curated ingredients at, at all, right? So this makes it the problem much harder, perhaps kind of artificially hard, right? Whereas in Yago, we had the philosophy, leverage what's there and then build on it and improve it. Which brings me to the next part, because now we have already a knowledge base and we can further improve it. So suppose uh, in this example, we look at the relationships. Now we're talking factual knowledge, relationships between entities, has doctoral advisor and alma mater. So the knowledge base 
in the previous part already has some instances for these. So some information is in, in info boxes, right? It's Wikipedia has some of that, but um, it's hopeless to think that uh, Wikipedia info boxes give us everything, right? So we get a few thousand uh, this way instances for each of the two relations, but there's definitely hundreds of thousands, if not millions of interesting scientists in the world notable scientists, um, and so we, we need to go to their home pages, to, uh, to biographies about uh, historically important people, and so on, and, and actually do text mining. Or we go to the full text of Wikipedia articles. In some cases, the information is there, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's phrased in natural language in the, in the body of the article. It's not in an info box. So, and these are some of the sentences that we might see. Jim Gray was one of Harrison's best students. Barbara Liskov wrote her thesis under the guidance of McCarthy. Pierre Sandela was one of Serge's best students. Pierre is not here, so we cannot ask him, and he cannot protest in case he doesn't like that statement. So, and so forth. So, what do we need to do here to kind of um, extract knowledge out of these sentences? First, we need to grab the entities. Who are the two people uh, that are talked about in, in these sentences? And that looks easy, but it's not always easy. In particular, there might be ambiguous uh, names like uh, Harrison McCarthy. So there's hundreds of Harrisons and McCarthys in Wikipedia alone, right? So which Harrison, which McCarthy? So we will turn to this later in the next part of the talk. So it's kind of mapping names of entities onto canonicalized, uniquely identifiable entities. And I postpone this for the next part. For this part, uh, just assume this is done. Because there's a second problem, which I want to focus on now, and this is uh, understanding these phrases. So what are the, the surface cues here so that we can say, well, probably there's an instance for one of these relations, so for the has advisor relation. So we need to understand best student under the guidance of his advisor. These are good cues, good uh, indicators, but influenced by is a shaky one, can be easily misleading, co-authored as well, right? So there's good ones and not so good ones, and we need, to do, we need to learn which is which. We can do deeper linguistic analysis. So this looks like we are just grabbing phrases from the surface text. We can do deep parsing of natural language, and then the, the representation of these patterns of phrases becomes more sophisticated, but that's not the key point here. So the, what we're going to do in the next few slides are about this. Uh, we actually um, pursue a twofold uh, methodology. One is driven by these patterns and, and surface phrases, and uh, along with some statistical evidence gathering. And it turns out by itself this is not good enough, so we need a second methodological component. And here we, uh, we exploit uh, reasoning about logical consistency. So as a combination in terms of methodology, the big picture here is combine statistical inference with logical inference. And this is a big and, and not so well understood uh, direction in computer science these days. So pattern-based gathering, we start with seed facts because we have a knowledge base. So Wikipedia gave us already a few. And then we can automatically search for these names, the two names, and find in a big corpus like the web, we find sentences where they occur, and we grab these patterns and his advisor, and the pattern can occur with different ones, so then the arguments become variables, x and y. Once we have these patterns, we can search with the patterns and then look at the noun phrases left and right or in the same sentence, in the same paragraph, and, and these form now candidates for the facts that we would like to, to gather. Uh, and we iterate, right? And we iterate, and we iterate. So that's a wonderful machinery, but it's not perfect. So it's good for recall. We get more and more and more and more, but there's typically a drift in the original focus. So these were really crisp, but after a while, so Seymour was influenced by Leibniz, but Leibniz died 300 years before uh, uh, Seymour left, and, and, and here, why would Nicoletta have Versailles as her doctoral advisor. I, I, I mean, obviously, we can pick up wrong things. Right? So this is why we have the second component, the logic-based reasoning. And here again, we have the uh, fact candidates, or hypothesis. Um, uh, has A means has advisor. So this is just a, a set of what you saw on the previous slide. And now we postulate or specify consistency constraints. This is done manually for the time being. You can think about 
rule learning as well, so computers could partly automate this, but it's not a huge effort doing this. So you sit down, you think about what's going on, and you postulate and specify a dozen constraints of this kind, right? This is a matter for someone who is trained, a knowledge engineer, if you wish. Uh, uh, it's a matter of 15 minutes. So let me go through some of them. So the first line just says that has advisor is actually a function. So you should have one advisor, not five advisors for your official advisors for your dissertation. This does not always hold. Of course, there are exceptions. But think of these constraints as soft constraints. So they should hold with high probability. And they would tolerate some exceptions. But by and large, they should hold. Second line says the has advisor relationship must be asymmetric. We cannot have Sash being my advisor, and I was also Sash's advisor. Unless we have multiple doctoral decrees and the advisor re advisee relationship was in different fields and so on, right? But these are the exotic cases. So this one I want to skip. There's some, uh, here there's lots of uh, type constraints. And here we leverage the knowledge base that we already have because this gives us 350,000 highly specific types. So we understand what a scientist is, what a, what a, what a quantum physicist is, and, and that this is also a subclass of scientists, and so forth. Um, and finally, we can specify constraints that are specific to these uh, relationships. So this one here uh, says, if your doctoral advisor was Y, and you graduated at University U, then Y should have been on the faculty of U. And the last one says, essentially, your doctoral advisor must have graduated as well and before you did, right? Not afterwards, right? So these are obvious things, right? But they help a lot. Now, you put everything together, a huge set of hypotheses and a small, carefully crafted set of consistency constraints, and you end up with faults. They are bound to be inconsistent because the process that gathered this typically makes errors. And once they are inconsistent, so the whole set of logical formulas is not satisfiable, then anything could be derived, so it's, it's worthless. But what helps us and what saves us is that typically you can find large subsets with, of these hypotheses that together with the constraints are consistent. So any consistent subset I would call here a possible world, and if one of them stands out by one criterion, say size, it's the largest, among the possible worlds, then we call it the truth, and we pick it up and put it into the knowledge base. And the knowledge base gets bigger and better. Uh, now, the, these guys here and these could have weights. They could, hear, they could come from the statistical evidence. So we saw certain hypotheses much more often than others and with more patterns and so on. And here we could specify weights that reflect the degree to which exceptions are possible or not. And if we have weights, then we can actually pick a, a possible world such that the, the formulas that are part of it have a large total weight, the, the sum of the weights, right? And this become, is a classical logical problem called, uh, or a computational science problem called weighted max set, weighted maximum satisfiability over a set of, of uh, Boolean uh, propositional logics formulas. It's NP hard, so it has high computational complexity, but there is a there's 20 or 30 years of, uh, of theory and, and, and engineering for, for uh, very good approximation algorithms. There are other ways of approaching this as well, but I want to move on. Uh, let me skip this uh, example demonstration. So this can actually be, this is the one and only one connection with Sash talk, uh, because he talked about MapReduce. So indeed, if, if you want to do this at large scale, and we did experiments within, there's a, a publicly available web crawl with half a billion English web pages. So you have to do this by some parallel system, and we do indeed use uh, one of the MapReduce uh, software systems, Hadoop, that Sash mentioned in his talk. And this goes very well. All the stages that I kind of sketched can be parallelized, some with heuristic uh, considerations. And this is a typical uh, experiment that we're doing. So we run this in iterations. Each iteration on a big input like this takes a few hours. But after a day, we have completed six iterations or so. And dealing with a huge input is the, the, the main part of the runtime. So this logic-based reasoning is actually a small fraction, not too bad. And then this is the harvest that we get. So in the sixth iteration, we get 50,000 new facts for 15 different relations, including has advisor. And turn, then we 
can evaluate the quality by sampling and with uh, statistics, uh, statistical confidence bound, bounds. And it turns out that 90% of what we gather is actually correct. But if we can further rank these uh, facts by some criterion and then uh, are willing to say, well, we want only the ones that have high confidence, for, in which we have high confidence, then we get close to 100% uh, correctness. So knowledge for intelligent applications. Now I want to turn things around. Now we start, we assume we have a rich knowledge base and we want to leverage for uh, computers simulating intelligent behavior. This is one application, question answering. So this got a lot of attention about a year ago because IBM built a computer system uh, called Watson that participated in an American TV quiz show called Jeopardy. This is wildly popular in the US TV. And it's kind of like, uh, there's, there's in Europe there's shows like who wants to be a millionaire. I'm, I think this is also in France. Uh, but the questions here are worded in a weird style. So they are like, this town is known as Sin City and its downtown is Clitter Gulch and so on. Um, and you, the participants need to give the answers straight. No uh, choosing among multiple choices, right? So it's actually harder than the kind of shows that we have here in, in Europe. And these are four example questions. Uh, Watson got the blue ones right and failed on the red ones, but nevertheless, Watson won the whole competition against two human super champions. So this was considered a breakthrough for artificial intelligence, now outperforming humans. After chess, 20 years or 10 years ago, now another thing where we thought humans are inherently superior to computers, no longer true. Um, Watson has a sophisticated machinery in particular in understanding and interpreting the input. Then it generates answer candidates, and it does so not in a structured data way, but it does so by going after text snippets, mostly from the full text of Wikipedia, but also from other web sources. Now, this produces lots of answer candidates, and uh, for one question of this kind, we could get answers like Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada, Monaco, um, um, George Bush, uh, Caesar's Palace Casino. So now there's, there's, it's inevitable you go after text, you produce rubbish like George Bush, right? Doesn't make sense here. Now they use real knowledge bases essentially for type checking the, the, the answer candidate. So they would ask, is George Bush a town? The result is to be, or a city, the result is supposed to be a city. No. Is Caesar's Palace Casino a city? No. Nevada neither, but Vegas or Las Vegas are. It, and, and this is a very useful ingredient here. Um, it does not solve the whole thing, but it's part of the story. Uh, one issue that remains here is also dealing with ambiguity. So when it picks up candidates like Vegas or Las Vegas, they're actually the same, right? How do you know? Or when you get as input, Sin City, what is meant by this? Uh, there's a movie called Sin City, yeah? Uh, but it also refers to some city. Uh, so ambiguity is everywhere. Here's a second application that's fictitious. It's made up on slideware. That's uh, machine reading. I alluded to this earlier. So what do I mean by this? So think of a complex book or maybe even an entire digital library and you want to uh, get, a, get a, a big picture of what's going on in a crisp way. So this is a crime thriller, The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. It's, it's, has hundreds of pages, and the first 100 pages introduce like 200 people. So you don't remember everybody and who's who and who's related to whom. So computers, what they could do potentially is mark up all the parts where a person is mentioned and then infer automatically that this part here, this uh, phrase, the old man, is actually the same person as Henrik Wanger, who is the same person as her uncle. Now, speaking of her uncle, we can infer family relationships, we can infer business relationships, and this is uh, crime thrillers, right? So all the, uh, the uh, spicy relationships between people, uh, who has an affair with whom, who would like to have an affair with whom, who tries to kill whom, who succeeds, who fails, and so on, and so on. So this is fictitious, and um, it's not, this is too hard if you take real literature, and this is probably not the hardest part, right? Uh, there are serious applications, so in digital humanities, if you want to look at a whole collection, and, and Google and MIT people have had a project called Culturomics, where they kind of do something along these lines. 
You can look at uh, scientific literature, like in the biomedical domain, and try to get a big picture of which diseases might be related to which other diseases or which symptoms and so on. So it's all in the same spirit. But everywhere, one of the underlying common problems, and now I'm getting technical again for the last part of the talk, is the ambiguity in the input texts. Uh, so I mentioned this in, in the uh, Watson question answering scenario for the input questions, there's ambiguous wordings. Uh, there's also uh, in the uh, answer candidates ambiguity or synonymy and homonymy. And so it, there's an underlying common problem given a word or a phrase like here Eli in this made up little text, what does it mean? Which Eli is this? Is this Eli from the Bible or is this an actor called Eli Wallach? Um, this is also the part on where I said earlier in the third part of the talk with the, remember, uh, Sash was one of Seymour's uh, best students or Ginsburg's best students. Uh, so we need to, Sash and Ginsburg are ambiguous, so which people are meant this way, right? So now I'm delivering how we can go about what I showed earlier. So this text is about the movie The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Sergio talked to Ennio about Eli's role in the ecstasy scene. And uh, when, when a, an entity is mentioned, often in short form or in paraphrased form, we call this a mention. And uh, there are several of them. And on the right-hand side, we have candidates, what this could mean. And the knowledge base, by its lexical knowledge, its terminological knowledge, and we have this at large scale in Iago and in other knowledge bases, can generate candidates. So we can kind of systematically generate the space of possible uh, alternatives. So Sergio has a bunch of, maybe Sergio is just Italian for Sash, so there's, there's uh, maybe some strong candidates and some not so strong but not totally absurd candidates. Eli could also be an acronym. Ecstasy could mean uh, methyl dioxide uh, methamphetamine. I practice this uh, several hours. Uh, and so the track, right? Or a musical composition, Ecstasy of Gold, and so on and so on. So these are possible mappings, and one of them is correct, and this is the one we want to compute. So the knowledge base gives us now lots of nice ingredients to do these computations and do them with high accuracy. Not perfect. Uh, this is even, even to humans who kind of annotate a, a complicated text might often disagree, right? So there's no, no way to achieve 100% accuracy in this game, but we can get as cl very close to what the best human experts could do. So popularity is one ingredient. When we say Eli, or so, sorry, when we say ecstasy, uh, we usually mean the, the, the track, right, the disco track. Uh, we rarely mean something else. So there's like a, a, a popularity-based or prominence-based prior. And uh, here we need to understand the conditional probability, if you wish, given a name like ecstasy, what's the likelihood that a particular entity is meant. Now, the knowledge base by itself doesn't have any, uh, any assets to this end, but we built the knowledge base by, from web sources like Wikipedia and other sources. And so we just have to remember where we saw an entity in the knowledge base construction process. Uh, and then every entity here can be associated, for example, with a Wikipedia article. Now, Wikipedia has rich links between articles. And links are, uh, have, are beasts with two components. They have a, these are hyperlinks, in the, like in the internet. They have, a, they have an anchor text, which is often in, sh in, 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 in short form, like would say ecstasy. And they have the actual link target, which is a URL. And this would say ecstasy track or methylene dioxide, methamphetamine, and so on, right? So these pairs give us a way of estimating this in a statistical way. Now, by itself, this would always favor the prominent entities, which is not what you want, right? So then we wouldn't have a chance to get this text right. Uh, uh, so there's another ingredient which is actually more important, but it's a slightly more complicated. That's contextual similarity. So when we look here at the, the word Eli, it, there's a, it's surrounded by other words or phrases. Now, this is something where information, re information retrieval as a subdiscipline of computer science has worked on for 40 years. So there's ways of casting such a, a text into a principled uh, uh, model. 
like a so-called bag of words model or vector space model or maybe uh, in a statistical language model over features like words, word pairs or entire phrases, right? So using some linguistic preprocessing, perhaps we can recognize noun phrases as opposed to uh, adverbial phrases or verb phrases. Uh, we can do this uh, with dimensions and we can do this also with the entity candidates because they are the entities and the knowledge base are associated with, with textual descriptions uh, in Wikipedia and the internet. So we have such a beast for Eli from the Bible and a different one for Eli Wallach. And now we have comparable things. We have apples versus apples and information retrieval and, and information theory gives us lots of principled ways of comparing them. And then the one, the one candidate where this similarity is largest would be the most likely uh, mapping uh, result if we used only this argument. Uh, there's a third argument, however, uh, namely, we not only want to map Eli, like popularity and similarity, we wouldn't need to know that Sergio and Trilogy and so on also need to be mapped. Uh, but it's actually helpful if we realize uh, there's a, a multitask setting here. It's not just one task at a time, but it's like, in this case, one, two, three, six tasks simultaneously. So we can do what machine learning people call joint inference. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's a, the intuition is the following. Suppose we had already mapped Ennio, so to Ennio Morricone. That would make mapping Sergio a lot easier, right? Because we know they often, I mean, Ennio Morricone composed the music in almost all Sergio Leone movies. Sergio Leone was the director, right? So that gives it away. But how do we know which order we should pick? And is any order the right order, right? And, and this, but this gives you the intuition and the right order of his cause, not having an order, but looking at everything jointly. And uh, the idea to get this under control is to look at the coherence between entities. Um, so there's an a priori probability that two entities co-occur in some meaningful text regardless of what exactly I write in the text. So Sergio Leone and Ennio Morricone have a high probability of co-occurring even if the text just says this great Italian spaghetti western director often worked with this classical composer from Rome, right? So the names are not mentioned but they co-occur. And this is a lot larger, this prob probability is a lot larger than, let's say, Serge Gembour uh, together with Ennio Morricone. Uh, this is called coherence for tractability. We look at this only for entity pairs, not, en not entire sets of entities. And if we can quantify the coherence between entities in some meaningful way, we can build a graph. So here we almost had a graph and think of these ingredients. They could give us edge weights here, right? So this is Without going into detail, you hopefully can envision this. Um, if we had quantitative measures of coherence, we can connect pairs of entities here as well and with edge weights. So the thick edges here should have high edge weights. There's a variety of ways for doing this, so for making this quantitative and constructing edge weights. So we have a type system. We have this fantastic type system. So we can, and, and each of these entities is in dozens of different types. So we can look at commonalities in the type system or whether there's types that are closely related. Uh, we can look at the link structure, similar to what I did here. Or we look at commonalities in anchor wordings for, again, link-based. But this can be generalized to doing noun phrase extraction first and looking at noun phrases that kind of co-occur but are kind of specific in the sense that it's not a noun phrase that occurs everywhere in the web, right? So there's ways of quantifying this. So once we have a graph of this kind, it's almost a bipartite graph. Bipartite is with two kinds of, uh, of nodes. So we have these mention nodes here and we have the entity candidate nodes here. And if we only had uh, weighted edges from left to right, then this would be a classical bipartite graph. But we have these additional edges which make it, makes the, the setting nastier. Still the idea here for computing a solution now is to compute a dense subgraph like this one and why would it be a dense subgraph? Well, dense under which criterion? Under the criterion that uh, once, I, once I pick a subgraph, I pick particular nodes here. And with these nodes, there are incident edges, the ones that connect the other nodes that are also in the subgraph. So some edges are thrown away. 
if these edges that remain in that subgraph together have a high weight, so the total weight of these edges is high, this could be a good solution. Because this tells us, well, similarity and, and other indicators work in favor of this mapping, and it also fits well with this mapping, right? So high, high weight edge here, and it fits well with this mapping. So this is the idea. Now it turns out the sum of the edge weights is not the best measure. It tends to pick substructures that are highly, that have like almost a click structure with high weights. Uh, and then there's the, this click core is surrounded by satellites that are either not connected or loosely connected, right? And so we split off the hard parts. We do fine on the, on the prominent entities that core occur very frequently together, and we miss out on the hard part with the more long tail entities. And so a better approach is to make the weakest link in this graph, subgraph, as strong as possible. Um, and this gives us more robust solutions. Now, what is the a way of strengthening the weakest link? So there is a notion of a weighted decree of a node. So the, the decree of a node is the number of incident edges, right? So this node has one, two, three, four purple outgoing edges in the final subgraph. Earlier in the full graph, it had more. And we sum up the weights of these edges. In this case, I think the weights is for the whole graph, but doesn't matter so much here. It's just the example. And then this gives us the weighted decree. And now a good solution is one which makes the minimum weighted decree among these resulting nodes that we pick in the final solution as large as possible. So not surprisingly, all these problems are, have high exponential complexity because there's some underlying combinatorics, right? So the, all these choices here depend on the choices there and so on. So you cannot avoid some exponential phenomenon here. But again, the, there's good approximation algorithms and we, I believe we have this pretty much under control. So it's published and systematically evaluated in benchmarks and so forth. But instead of uh, going into this, I want to give you a short impression on the, uh, on the actual system that we have. This is online. You can try it out yourself. The URL is down here. It's called AIDA for Accurate Online Disintegration. This is my example, a little bit expanded and varied. Um, there is some special markup here because we use a tool, a, a natural language processing tool, that uh, recognizes noun phrases that could be entity names. And it misses out in a few cases when a noun phrase like uh, ecstasy and trilogy can be a common word or a name for some entity, right? And so, but we, this is a technicality, but we can help it. The disambiguation is not influenced by this, so it's not a big help. And then a standard tool, uh, standard methods that we can also simulate or have as part of our repertoire in our system would do uh, indeed MDMA for the ecstasy, the designer truck. Uh, would do a lot of the rings and would pick uh, Eli from the Bible. You do the smart method with all the bells and whistles inside and activated, and uh, it works perfectly well. So, and the trilogy is the Dollars trilogy, three movies about the same theme, Ecstasy of Gold, and so on. And, and even Ma, very short, is mapped to the shallow player Yo Yo Ma. So, and the candidate space is big. So this is just so we can visualize the candidates and different colors represent how, how the goodness of the candidates. So green obviously is the best and dark red further down would be the worst uh, as computed by our algorithm. And even for a simple word like trilogy in the context of movies, there's several dozens of candidates. Uh, for the first names here, there's, there's uh, hundreds. And uh, you take, a, let's say, a news article as input, and you quickly have 10,000 of candidates here. So this graph problem that I sketched actually is over a graph with 10,000 of nodes. It's not a, not, and, and it's ex the, in principle, the complexity is exponential in the number of nodes of this. Um, to prove that this also works for French people, Bruno wrote the score for Himalaya, and this is mapped to Bruno Coulet. Although this is a tiny input, right? And there's probably... Uh, in terms of a priori uh, probabilities, there's much better candidates, in particular for Himalaya. So it's all by coherence. So this is only possible by the coherence argument. I can crap either with a mouse and then stuff into this window, or we have a browser plugin. I can mark up something in news articles, like this news about uh, Steve Jobs' memorial. 
And then I get the markup in entities. This is easy because they're all prominent and they're fully given. So I removed some last names and some first names, right? So I made uh, Bill Clinton Bill and Yo-Yo Ma became Ma. Bono has only first name, so there's no last name. But Joan and Bob and so on, and they all, all are mapped correctly. So this is an, a special case of a, a more general problem in natural language processing and computational linguistics called the word sense disambiguation problem. And this is actually a the problem we would also have to solve fully for the question answering uh, examples I gave earlier when I said, well, this town is known as uh, Sin City and so on, right? So, um, or there was one question with a Swedish chain. So chain is a very ambiguous word, can mean all kinds of things. So here's one other example, which songwriters covered ballads written by the Stones? So songwriters is not too ambiguous. So there's maybe a word net entry for songwriter but covered has at least three different meanings, very different meanings, and WordNet actually tells me there's 20 or 30 different meanings. Uh, ballads can be poems or songs, and the stones, unless I give it away and, tell, tell, and someone tells me, well, it's either a person or a group of people, uh, it could also be rocks or jams or walls and so on. Now here too, this whole same principle applies. We haven't worked this out fully, but this is work in progress. But uh, again, we have a notion of semantic coherence. Uh, once you know that this is a music band, so then this interpretation of cover makes a lot of sense. The others make less sense. So this can be leveraged here, and hopefully in a year or so, we might have a strong result on this general problem as well. OK, so time is over. Should I wrap up? Or? Yeah, OK. So then just two. I have two. Uh, directions for um, re further research opportunities and the, the challenges that are involved this way. And one is about the unknown knowledge. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Well, we give ourselves a, we, we, it's like the French word, idiom, right? Corriger la fortune, right? <laughs> so without saying that we cheat, but we, we give ourselves a good head start on all these uh, knowledge harvesting uh, endeavors by having um, canonical relations. So we uh, usually go for relations that are specified up front, and they have a type signature. So we know Mary, too, is a relation we're interested in, and one award is a relation we're interested in, and it's the latter holds between people and prizes. Right? But if we want to be dynamic and we want to understand whatever is posted on the web and social media and news, and, and, and also, when new people become prominent, we want to understand them. They are new entities, even, maybe even before they are in Wikipedia, right? So now we have a different problem, and we need to settle with understanding names and phrases again, without necessarily having disambiguated them. And here's a bunch of examples. And it turns out her happy marriage with, we might be able to infer this is the same relation as married to. And was honored by is the same relation as one award. So no new business. But these other two things, passionate love with, this is probably a new relation, right? And it's maybe, and this was disappointed nomination for, is also a new relation. We ha nobody specified it for us. We want to discover it on the fly automatically, and then maybe even position it with regard to the previous relations, like saying, well, it's a new relation, and it's a super relation of this one. To win an award, you have to be nominated first, usually. Right? And uh, some subtlety, so there's also the same difficulties show up in terms of new entities. So the first lady, the French president, yes, this could be phrases denoting known entities. Uh, and it would have been a correct sentence as of a week ago. But now they might actually denote new entities, right? And at least one of them, I think, his, his partner, Hollande's partner, is not in Wikipedia, probably. So we wouldn't know the first lady by that name in, in our knowledge base already. Second direction that we're working on and that is interesting and challenging is temporal knowledge, already alluded to uh, uh, spouse relations. Um, so we have some of this in, in the knowledge base, but uh, we are not anywhere near high coverage. And so I would phrase this as a benchmark challenge. So start with the people in Wikipedia, just so that we have a well-defined set of people, not that we're working only with Wikipedia. And this is uh, at least 300,000. 
try to find all their spouses, former ones, current ones, and the corresponding uh, time periods. And for that, you definitely have to go into the web, right? So even if one, per one part, uh, person in a partnership is prominent, the other often is not, but somewhere in the, in the, in the web, in news, et cetera, or tabloids, you find that information. Uh, so that is hard. And you just by ex proof of hardness by example, so you read this uh, text about Madonna, and even a human has a hard time to differentiate between romantic relationship and marriage, right? Uh, Sarkozy, at least back when I did the screenshot, yes, the spouses were mentioned, but no dates. So you have to go to the web to find the dates. Or now they are in Wikipedia, I'm pretty sure. And this is a, a very difficult, notoriously hard problem from European history. And to deal with this, you have to uh, do smart reasoning. You have to learn that divorced and beheaded are kind of equivalent as far as this knowledge harvesting uh, task is concerned. So in going about this, again, I would mimic the, what I uh, presented earlier. So first we go, we gather fact candidates at the expense of uh, picking up some noise, so it's a hypothesis space, and then I would use logical reasoning to prune out that noise and make it high quality. And consistency constraints are very helpful here. So uh, in database jargon, this is called a functional dependency. So for at any given time point, in most countries, one husband has one wife, or at most one wife and vice versa. There's inclusion dependencies. There's all kinds of age, time, gender restrictions. Now, they don't hold universally worldwide. They might depend on culture, legislation, et cetera. But we can make the constraints smarter. So they can have a precondition, if so-and-so, so-and-so, then, right? And if else, then else. So this is the direction to go. So in wrapping up, so what did I show you? I started by telling you what a knowledge base should be and uh, that it should be crisp and well-structured and uh, semantically uh, rich. And then we started by doing the slow-hanging fruit picking, so knowledge harvesting, harvesting in the sense of picking fruit, as opposed to data knowledge mining, which is like heavy labor below the, the surface, right? So I prefer harvesting over mining. Uh, and this good already went a long way. And then we use that to tap into arbitrary web pages and natural language texts. And finally, in the last part, I showed you how to use the knowledge base to do a better job on understanding texts on disambiguating names. So this is a take home message. So this is an old dream, machine knowledge and having really comprehensive knowledge bases. It's, it's, AI has talked about this in the 60s and 70s, but only talked. Uh, and now it's real and it's big. Uh, knowledge bases are a, a, a really strong asset for all kinds of intelligent computer applications. And I pointed out some of them as we went through the talk. And uh, maybe one important thing to realize is as if we have a knowledge base, we can do a better job on understanding the inputs here, understanding text and also, also table structures on the web. So the web is full of heterogeneous, noisy tables. So having background knowledge helps in many of these. And if we can do a better job on interpreting what we have here, we can do a better job on extracting more knowledge, deeper knowledge, better knowledge. So there's a virtuous cycle with explicit knowledge, machine knowledge. We are in a good situation to produce even better knowledge. And there's uh, rich research opportunities and challenges. Thank you very much.